Hi, welcome to Transparent with Tina. I'm Tina Marks, your host, and today I have an amazingly talented guest who I have the pleasure of interviewing a second time in my lifetime. He has a mat, he has an MS in nutrition, he has a PhD in natural health, a doctorate in natural path. He's written over a hundred peer-reviewed articles, over 70 books, keynote speaker around the world. He's considered one of the top research scientists in the last two and a half decades, and he's his own product line. Boy, that was a mouthful to get out. I'm glad it wasn't anymore. <laughs> Please welcome my guest, Dr. Robert O. Young. Hi, Tina. Hi. Welcome. So good to see you again. Yeah, nice to, nice to see you again. In fact, uh, I, I, remember, I remember our interview, and uh, it's still out there, so people can watch that. Exactly. And you know what? I'm going to let something into our viewers because I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember when I came to your house? Yeah. And I did not realize you were the man that wrote the PH Miracle. I mean, I, you know, I guess I was spaced. I mean, I knew that you were behind the idea, but then I got into the room where we were going to film and I saw all these books and all these products and I turned to my cameraman and I said, this is the guy. I mean, this isn't somebody that supports the idea. This is the guy. So anyways, I've done my research this time. And like I said, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank um, you. There is so much to talk about. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, you know, something I just read about too, is I did not realize you were an avid tennis player. And I was reading that uh, when you went to University of Utah, that you actually played with Roscoe Tanner and Jimmy Connors and Stan Smith. You still play tennis? Uh, only in my mind, uh, and, and I have a tennis court uh, there at the ranch, uh, and I get out there once in a while, but, you know, things have really changed. I mean, the new crave in the United States is not tennis, it's pickleball. Pickleball! <laughs> you know, everybody's playing pickleball, and uh, so tennis courts are being converted uh, to pickleball courts. Yeah, <laughs> it's somebody, I actually like it, because you know what, I kill it in pick, pickleball, but tennis is you know, a lot more difficult of a sport. So it's like, I feel like I'm really shining with the pickleball, so. I yeah, well, I had a, I had a good friend, uh, his name was Bill Benyon. He was on uh, on the, the university team uh, at U uh, University of Utah. And, uh, you know, we used to play uh, this game. It, it was called dink tennis. And dink tennis is where you, you don't hit it really hard. What you do is you dink it over you know, and and force your opponent, you know, to have to play that game. And for someone in, in, in a an amateur, high level amateur sport or professional sport, uh, dink tennis was also a trademark of Ily Nastasi. I don't know if you remember Ily Nastasi. I do. Okay, well, Ily Nastasi uh, played dink tennis, and it used to drive everybody crazy. Oh yeah, it used to drive me crazy too. We used to call it pachi ball. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so if, if you like dink tennis, where you're just dinking it over the ball, and it's more strategic in keeping the ball low to the net and just slightly so it doesn't bounce up, mm -hmm. uh, then of course uh, it's kind of like what, was, what is called the drop shot. Yes, yeah. The drop shot, and uh, so pickleball is kind of like the drop shot because uh, it's it's not a power game even though some of the professionals it just so happens my son Adam mm -hmm. is a professional oh in in uh, pickleball in fact he was uh, going to go to the, the US Open in in uh, pickleball mm -hmm. and he's also he, he's also you know he's a he's a paid professional so he he plays at that particular level and he's the one that introduced it to me and well, uh, I the number one growing sport in the country, or if not the world, right? Yeah. Yep. So I don't know how many people are interested in this. The reason I, you know, mention it because it's probably the best activity for someone over 65 I at any age, actually. But someone who's over 65 that wants to get extra exercise, you can play uh, hit it and giggle uh, pickleball too, where you hit it and giggle and. You know, and it, it, it can be a real social type of event, but I think emotionally, physically, and uh, spiritually, I think it can really lift a lot of people. You know? I agree. And it, yeah, and it's not a hard, it's not like tennis, where you have, to, you have to really gain skills to play that. You don't have to have a lot of athletic 
uh, ability, and I don't mean that uh, disparagingly at all. I, I hear you. You know, I just there's just some people say, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm just not that coordinated. Mm -hmm. You know, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to. Be always there. Okay. <laughs> you just have to be able to see the ball, and, uh, and and then you have this paddle and hit it back and forth over the net. Exactly. Here again, uh, it's a great activity. Yeah, and it, and it's good to get it's good to get out. Uh, in the open air, it's good to get sunshine, and uh, it's also good to socialize, which uh, a lot of that hasn't been happening for the last uh, uh, two to three months. You know, why don't we just start there? Because I was just having this conversation with somebody uh, about the detriments of not being social. You know, we are social creatures, and what kind of impact do you think that that's having on people psychologically? physically well I, I think socially uh, i mean individually i think it's depressing mm -hmm. uh especially if you're incarcerated uh into your own home uh this this can be problematic i mean just the idea of having n the lack of freedom to be able to come and go mm -hmm. is, is somewhat uh, emotionally disturbing mm -hmm. and uh and so they're seeing, and, and there are those that are quantifying this, increase in suicide. They're seeing increase in battery, you know, uh, uh, particularly at home and, you know, spousal abuse. Exactly. Uh, uh, these things uh, are increasing. On top of that, on top of that, you're not getting outside. And, and when you go outside, you have to wear a mask, which actually forces uh, back because you're breathing your own, you're exhaling carbon dioxide, but you're breathing that back in, which can, which can lead to what, I, what is called pathological blood coagulation. If the body can't, can't get rid of its own carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. then it can be a detriment to the natural flow of blood uh, into the pulmonary system where you have blood that flows into the pulmonary system, into the alveoli uh, to pick up oxygen and then dump, dump its carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. That can't happen uh, if you're breathing an abundance of the very thing the body's trying to get rid of because that carbon dioxide is then exhaled. Yes. And if you're, if you're bringing that back into the body because you have a mask on, uh, this can uh, uh, lead to other conditions which begin uh, with blood sticking together or aggregating. It's called pathological blood coagulation. A more uh, medical term would be called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And what happens is the blood begins to clot because, because carbon dioxide uh, is a waste product, is a, an acidic waste product, it will cause cells to stick together. Now, why is that? Why is that important? Well, can blood circulate into the lungs through the pulmonary system to pick to dump carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen? And the answer to that is absolutely not. And the reason for that is the opening into the capillary system is between three to five microns in diameter, which means. Uh, we're looking at, at a micron at one twenty-five thousandths of an inch. So if you have a red blood cell, which is seven micron, which actually has to kind of bend and, and kind of shrink itself in a way by bending into the capillary system, this is a, a serious challenge when you have groups of red blood cells that are aggregated to the tune of anywhere from three, five, 10, 50, 100. I mean, these become, this becomes even more and more, system, uh, more and more uh, serious. And this is what leads to uh, what is called interstitial fluid lung disease. And interstitial fluid lung disease is when the fluids that surround all the cells in the, in, in the lungs and throughout the body are retained within those fluids causing cellular membrane breakdown and genetic mutation. Now this has been wrongfully, and I emphasize this word, wrongfully associated to a viral infection, but it is not. The membrane breakdown and the genetic mutation is due to 
pathological blood coagulation, the inability of the blood to remove its waste product and pick up oxygen, and the fact that the blood is clotting inside your own vascular system, those acids cannot be removed. Other acids like lactic acid and uric acid become even more difficult to remove from the foods we eat, maybe the air we're breathing. If you're living in Wuhan, you're being exposed to carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, a lot of toxic uh, waste from factories because it's a factory city of 11 million people and it's one of the most polluted uh, cities in the world. So when you, when you, take, you, when you, you take that, yeah, when you take that and breathe it in, it's, it's, so it becomes a huge problem. Is the result uh, shortness of breath then? If you're wearing a mask too long and this is yeah, not- the, 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 What happens is it begins with shallow breathing. Okay, or, and then shortness of breath, like you're walking and you have shortness of breath. And then eventually as toxins build up, that can't be removed. Yes. Then it, it ends up into what is what is also referred to as a high altitude sickness disease. And those are the same symptoms of COVID. Okay. I was I was just going to say the very thing that we're trying to prevent by wearing masks because it's it's a, it's a respiratory disease, if you will you're actually bringing this on by wearing a mask. Well, let me ask you, like, what duration of time would that be? Would that be somebody that's wearing a mask for half an hour? Or is that somebody that's wearing a mask going to work for eight hours a day? Well, you know, as, as kids, we play this stupid little game, hold your breath and pass out. Right. You know, so if you're, if you're holding on to your carbon dioxide, you're not releasing it you can actually end up with a sudden de death syndrome. They call it a syndrome because they don't understand the pathology because you cannot, it can happen within three to four minutes. So this is what was happening in Wuhan, but it wasn't just chemical poisoning. It was also radiation poisoning. So it was air pollution, chemical pollution, food pollution from the air, from the food, from the environment. And then on top of that, when you're looking at a pulsating uh, frequency of 60 gigahertz, when they turn that switch on, and from my sources, they did turn the switch on. They've probably turned it off because the death, sudden death syndrome stopped. People were just falling over dead like flies. Mm -hmm. Like they're walking and drop dead. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what happens with high altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. You can't get enough oxygen in and you just retaining more and more causes a symptom called hypoxia and hypoxia then is, as carbon dioxide mix, uh, uh, increases, then you end up with carbon dioxide poisoning. Okay. So while we're on this, I mean, you can answer, you, you don't have to answer. What do you, tell me what you think of the, of the COVID and, and I know that we had discussed a question earlier, like what is a virus? And what, let's say, what does HIV have to do with COVID? Well, COVID uh, is originally associated with, uh, or, or, or what was called SARS. SARS is, uh, uh, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory uh, Syndrome. And anytime you, you, you label a condition, a syndrome, what, it, what it's suggesting in medical terms is that you do not know the pathology of it. It hasn't been, it hasn't been determined. Mm -hmm. This is one of the major problems with COVID is there is no pathology for the cause. So unfortunately, a practice in virology that began, you know, well, we could say it began in 1918 with the Spanish flu epidemic because they couldn't, they didn't want to put the blame where the blame, and I'm not going to, you can read my article, it, it's historical as it relates to what was the cause of the Spanish flu epidemic that killed up to 100 million people. Now, we're not even close to, to, to the, the, the level of death worldwide as it relates to uh, the Spanish flu epidemic. But this idea of virology is a concept that really only exists on a piece of paper. 
Mm -hmm. It's an idea. You see, the problem with with virology is the virus of any sorts, whether we're talking about polio, if we're talking about measles, if we're talking about the hepatitis virus, if we're talking about uh, the Zika virus. And a lot of these names come up because they're named after rivers or lakes or streams or, uh, you know, or I mean, the Spanish flu epidemic didn't start in Spain. It actually started in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. How that all got started is, is another part of, part of the story of, of this, you know, the Spanish flu epidemic, which I have written an article on. Uh, but here then you have SARS, uh, you have the Hong Kong flu, uh, you then have, uh, you know, SARS, which was uh, 2002, which is COVID-02. Uh, so you have that. Now, the interesting thing, they're calling this, uh, oh, then you have HIV. We can't forget HIV. Right. Very important, critical time uh, when HIV came on the scenes, which was approximately 1981. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a, a great uh, scientist and researcher at the University uh, of California, Berkeley, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Duisberg, wrote a book which he then published in 1985. And I have to, I have to say that he influenced a lot of my ideas that became more solidified when I was studying under Dr. Marie Blecker in, in Essen, Germany. Uh, pathology, microbiology, you know, phase contrast, dark field, phase, uh, bright field, microscopy, electron microscopy. When I was studying, uh, which I've been involved in for the last four decades, uh, she kind of set my, the stage too. So I was influenced uh, by, by Peter Duisberg, and I was also influenced by my, my professor, uh, Dr. Marie Blecker. And the whole etiology here is, is somewhat similar, and I'll explain. With HIV, Duisberg could not connect a virus with AIDS, okay, the acquired immune deficiency. Mm -hmm. There's an immune deficiency, so they tied it to this virus. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I couldn't connect it, because they couldn't locate it. Right. They couldn't isolate it. They couldn't say, aha, there is the culprit. And once you find something, depending on how you're using it, how you're, you're, you're trying to determine its existence, one of it is through identification through an electron microscopy. Uh, you can identify the appearance. Now, I want you to remember this because that's been done. Okay, the appearance of what what they're calling HIV happens to be identical to COVID-19. Interesting. Okay. Now what they were taking a picture of is what they called HIV and what they call now COVID happens to be identical to what is called an exosome, which actually is a form very small, tiny form that's found within all of our cells. It's released during an onslaught uh, of acidity, when acidity increases in the environment. These actually help to protect the membranes and also help to protect the lining of our blood vessels from deterioration. They're called endothelium cells so that they don't break down because if they break down, that exposes the basement membrane and we go into what is called a uh, cascade of clotting, and that's that's disastrous. But the body's trying to trying to stop internal bleeding. You know, it's interesting because I read this not too long ago. Um, I've, I've read it several times. Is that you know, for example, cancer. Everybody hear they hear the word, they want it cut out of their body. Cancer is actually letting you know that your body is out of alignment. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's actually a. a it, a great thing to identify that there's something off. And you know, when I first uh, interviewed you, um, I there, what, what, what brought me to you is I had breast cancer. And you were one of the three books that I had read. Yours was one, Dr. Gundry's was another, and then Suzanne Summers 
about her, her uh, experience with cancer. And that was 12 years ago. And they had recommended um, radiation and tamoxifen. And after reading your book, I decided against that. I did not do that. And I just followed your diet. I got the alkaline machine and I've been cancer free for 12 years.